Welcome to New Life Living, brought to you by New Life Church in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. We hope this Bible study led by one of our guest teachers encourages you in living the new life Jesus is offering. I'd be bad. Well, good morning. How are you guys this morning? Well, praise God. Praise God. Uh, if you're new here with us this morning, we'll uh, welcome you to New Life. Uh, if you're not, I'll still welcome you. <laughs> What a beautiful morning is you, if we got to see the balloons rolling around here this morning. It was pretty neat to see. It's that season. But uh, it's pretty amazing that uh, the things that we see, uh, we look around and can see God through everything. If we have our eyes open. As we jump in this morning, we'll be looking at the, the book of Luke, chapter 18, uh, verses 18 through 30. And I'll be going through the English Standard Version this morning. And uh, hopefully you can follow along with me. There's also the app you can get involved with and in looking at that. But I want to start by this morning. We're going to try to go through this quick because there's a lot in here. So I'm going to jump right in. Uh, but before I do so, if you guys would turn there um, to look, I'm going to pray for us right quick. Well, Father, again, I do lift up this time to you, Lord. And that we would have your full attention that our our minds and hearts would be in tune with yours this morning. Lord, I just ask that you would remove our scales from our eyes, from our hearts and our ears this morning, that we would hear you clearly. Father, I just ask that you would move, as Matt says, and um, that you'd make changes in our hearts this morning, in Jesus' name. How many of you this morning have ever went and uh, went to the store and ever purchased something, and there was a little thing attached to it? before the sale was complete, and it was called an agreement of terms and conditions. Somebody's looking for their phone. There's always this little thing that we have to sign. I'm sure, I'm sure you guys can agree with that, right? But what does this exactly mean? This means that we have read and agree to keep the terms set before us. Whatever it is, say if it's a firstborn, I don't know what it is that you have to give up sometimes when you push this agree. And it reads something like this. I have read and understand this agreement, and I accept and agree to it, all of its terms and conditions. I enter into this agreement voluntarily with full knowledge of its effect. Anybody ever done, seen that? Okay. How many of you guys just skip over that? Skip, skip, skip. Okay. It, it's kind of, of what we do, what we're doing with God's word. Keep this in mind next time you just skip over it. It may require more than you're willing to give. Or into God's word, it means a little bit different than just skimming over it. There's a, there's a change that should happen. If not, it's just another book. You might as well pick up the, the old TV guide. I always mention that. I don't even know there's a TV guide anymore. I think it's just like a... That dates me really bad, right? Some of you guys know that. So anyways, you know how old I am. But we're going to jump in right into Luke 18, and I'll read the verses to you, and then we'll pick them apart. Here in chapter 18, verse 18, And a ruler asked him, him being Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not, do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And this guy says, huh, I've done all these things from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack, sell all, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when he heard this, this young guy, he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it, easier, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, then who can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said, see, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left his house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times more in this time, in the age to come, eternal life. That's enough of that story. And uh, you guys can figure it out. Just kidding. That's it. 
In our story this morning, we see this guy, this young ruler. And we see three different accounts in this. We see one in Mark, we see one in Matthew, and now we see one in Luke. And uh, I, when you get a chance, even in the life groups or wherever you're at, take a look at those three different accounts. It gives you an, a rounded idea of where, who this guy is and what he's all about. But he's a devout religious Jew, rich, young, prominent, influential, moral, respected, all of that. In the, in the culture of his day, he would, had absolutely everything, so he was the top tier. In the middle of all this religion, all this morality, and all this spirituality, and all this affirmation that he must have received from the people in all respect, he had a huge hole in his heart. And many of you this morning know what that huge hole in the heart looks like. Sometimes people explain it as being that God-shaped hole that nothing can fill till he fills that, like that jigsaw puzzle. And we can fill it and fill it and it never satisfied. Something was missing in this guy's life. This is um, where the urge to come to Christ begins for some people. They're looking for something they, and they're not total, totally satisfied till they find him. So this guy, he approached Jesus and said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus replied to, him, replied to him, Why do you call me good? Only God alone is good. And after researching this to the Jewish culture, God, God was, I mean, good was set alone just for God. So when they mentioned good, that's why the response was. But there was a correlation to why he called him good teacher. But we won't get into that. You can get into that on your own studies. But look at it. So looking further in, in these verses, a, few thing, a couple of things pop up. What must I do is the first one, which seems like it's, it works. What can I do? You know, this guy was doing a lot in the synagogue or whatever it was. But what else do I need to do to get the eternal life? We must remember that he lives in a sy system of self-righteous works and legalism. He's a Pharisee. So this is where this guy's at. He's used to doing self-righteous works, outward stuff. So what can I do here that everybody else sees to make this happen? And that's what he was looking at. He thought it was an outward, another outward thing. Secondly, why exactly is he asking about eternal life? Because he knew he didn't have it. And he wanted it, so he's asking. You know, looking back as I went over this is we know a lot of times where we're at and we know if we have it or not. And it's just that conviction upon our heart that we don't have it. So I think that this guy is coming and say, I don't have it, even though where he was at. The ruler's question concerning the requirement for eternal life reveals a spiritual hunger that was not being satisfied by his wealth, his influence, authority, or his position. None of those things could get him to where he needed to be. But what is he meaning by eternal life? I want eternal life. What is he talking about there? Just simply living forever? I want to live forever? Is that what he's asking? Was he talking about the duration of life? Was he talking, uh, saying, I don't want to ever die? What is this guy exactly saying here? I fear death? Or is it, I just want to keep on living like this forever? If it is that, I thought about that. Would I want to continue to live like this forever here? And I'm, I asked myself when I said, no, I don't want to continue to live here. As the more and, day, the more and more days go by, I'm getting more and more sick of this place. And I know that this is not my home, as he says. I'm ready to move over to the other place. The tent is getting old and ripped. So you guys can identify with that. This guy was looking what he was really looking for. He was looking for a deep, intimate relationship with the living God, something that he did not possess. It was just an outward appearance that he had, a facade, a religion. That's all he had that people could see. If you looked at the Pharisees and Sadducees of that day, that's all it was. That's why Jesus was saying that you're like whitewashed tombs, all pretty on the outside, but a heart full of dead man's bones. That's what he said. This guy, what he's looking for is a life that is not temporal, a life that is not earthly, a life that is not in the likeness of humanity, but a life that is in the likeness of God. That's what he was after. 
Not about, I want to be like him, I want to be like that person over there. He wanted to be as God was. Maybe that's some of you this morning. Maybe you want a life that's not temporal. A life that's not earthly. A likeness that's not like that other person, but you want one that looks like God. That might be you this morning. Maybe you're just coming, uh, living with a facade this morning, and you need the living God to come and invade your life and change it radically this morning. Maybe that's what we need this morning. Maybe just that facade is just coming to church on Sundays, and then the rest of the week, that's the only time you come in contact with God. Is that what it is for you this morning? As you're asking that, yourself that question, when I go through the motions maybe, is this is just a facade? I'll ask you a second question. Are you comfortable with your salvation this morning? Are you comfortable with where you're at? It's a question only you can answer. A lot of times we get comfortable and not do anything else. I raise my hand, isn't that enough? If you've been reading your Bible, that's not enough. Let's look at verses 20 and 21. Where Jesus here comes and he tells him, you know the commandments, this young guy. Do you not commit, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, huh, all these things I've kept from my youth, he tells Jesus. Wow. What seems like the perfect opportunity for Jesus to share himself. We usually share Jesus. Jesus has to share himself at this point. I tell him, you know, you say this prayer, I'm, I'm going to die on the cross. He, he didn't give him grace, he didn't give him mercy. But if you look at this passage, he gave him the law. He gave him the law rather than grace and mercy. Wasn't he supposed to give him that? He called him to something else. You know, here he calls him to obedience. All this guy has ever known is uh, self-made morality, spirituality, and a relationship with God from his belief system. It was that outward steel facade that on the outside that people could see. That's the turning point here. When all of a sudden the one who thinks he's going to gain eternal life by keeping the law begins to realize that the law is not giving him life. The law is killing him because it is rendering him guilty before God, which there will be an eternal unrelieved judgment. The law will cry out against you of how sinful you are. That's why Jesus came for us, to rescue us, because he knew that we couldn't keep that law. He said, I didn't come to abolish it. I came to fulfill it. But him on that cross paid that, that we didn't have to do that. But now here this guy is going through this. If you want to live by the law, you're going to die under that law, basically. So when Jesus heard this in verse 21, I kept this from my youth. He could have said, you big liar. You have not. I know who you are. He didn't argue with him one bit. How great this was of Jesus. I would have said, really? That would have been me. But he knew where he was. He knew, or did he know where personally he was? He knew where his heart was at that point. At that point, he realized he was an illegitimate seeker. He was not there. Jesus knew his heart. Even in the Gospel of Mark, it explains it, that he ran to the feet of Jesus. And seemingly genuine, Jesus read him like a book at that point. I already knew where he was coming from. As he does us. He knows when we're coming in submission. He knows when you're real. And he knows when you're fake. You know, it's, it's, it's easy to be around people around us. And, you know, it's easy to, to fool people around us into thinking we're way into God and do all the, and say all the right things. You know, that Christian bumper sticker that I have, you know, and I say all the stuff and I'll pray for you, but never do type stuff. But the Lord knows our hearts. He knows exactly where you're at. For you Bible scholars out there, there's a word for that, that he's all-knowing. What is that? Omniscient. He knows everything. 
And that's the thing. You can't, you can't play with that. So he's never going to know. I've always accounted that to, like, uh, not that I play with dolls, but let me just give you an illustration. Those old doll houses that you could pull off the lid and you could look into the rooms and stuff like that. As Jesus does that, pulls the lid off of us and looks into our hearts and gets to see exactly what's going on. So it's hard to hide things from him. You know, the Bible is full of heart issues of how to correct those. He saw that this guy was superficial, something I never want to be called. As I looked at, at this, I looked up the word superficial and it said this. Superficial is just on the surface, appearing to be true or real only till examined more closely. What will you say when you're face to face with Jesus? Uh, I'm going to examine your heart. What is that going to look like? I want something different for me. I don't know about you. But here's this guy asking how to get eternal life. And Jesus tells him to keep the commandments. And the guy says, I've done this since my youth. Wow. In essence, he's telling God, I'm clean before you. <laughs> That's a scary thing. I'm going to stand away because there's some electricity coming towards your way. You know, type of stuff. That's what I see. <laughs> and yeah, it's just uh, that. But here, how many here this morning are at that point? Say, I'm clean before you. And there's that old book. I read you. There's the old dollhouse. I don't know. So here's the kicker in verse 22. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Here's this old defibrillator on the heart. Get rid of your stuff. I could hear the, the echo in that. Get rid of your stuff for this guy. Now here's the real test for this guy. Something that's been dragging him down for so long is this anchor on his heart. This, his heart is divided over his wealth and between him and God. We can fall into the same trap. Put yourself in this guy's shoes and ask yourself, could you do this? Could you get rid of your stuff? Well, I just bought that 60 inch and I'm looking at the 75 inch. I want the curved screen, you know? We always looking for something more and more and more and we get deeper and deeper into this place rather than the, into, into his place. Well, I've worked hard. I've invested and given to the poor. I've even served the homeless. Jot this down. Matthew 7, 21 to 7, 23. Read this when you get home or if you get a chance this evening, read what that says. Many would say here, it's not that he had treasure, but the treasure had him. That is true, right? It was a struggle. So it really did have him. But the truth of the matter is, is he, he wanted to continue to live the way he was living and still wanted God. He wanted to still live in the septic tank, the cesspool of this world and still wanted God. That's the division that he had. Somewhere, somewhere I heard it said, it's in my Precious Moments book, I think, uh, you can't serve two masters or something. I'm just kidding. It's in Matthew 6, 24, where it says, No one can serve two masters, for one will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. God and that new car. God and that football team. You can't serve both of those things with your heart. He wants all of you. Jesus talks a lot about, about the heart, where your heart is, the treasure is going to be also. You guys remember that as well. As I was studying this week, I came across a cute story from Ravi Zacharias. I'm sure some of you guys know who that is. When he was growing up in India, he tells a story 
of a little boy who had lots of pretty marbles, but he was constantly eyeing his sister's bag full of candy. One day he said to her, if you give me all your candy, I'll give you all my marbles. She gave it much thought and agreed to the trade. He took all her candy and went back to his room to get his marbles. But the more he admired them, the more reluctant he became to give them all up. So he hid the best of them under his pillow and took the rest to her. That night, she slept, she slept soundly while he tossed and turned restlessly, unable to sleep and thinking, I wonder if she gave me all her candy. We want all the candy that Jesus has to offer, yet still hiding and fantasizing about the, the things of this world. We want to hide those marbles in our hearts and be divided. We want all his blessings, but yet we're attached to something else. Only things that are done in the Lord is going to last here. You know, we sell ourselves short and we want instant gratification. Things that happen fast without lasting gratification. Things that last, eternal things. He said they'd test by fire with wood, hay, and stubble of our works. I wonder how that's going to all look. You know, I'm, I'm afraid of all of that stuff. But you know, at the end, the grave is going to claim all your riches, your fame, and you'll be left with nothing. You will. Church, we sell ourselves short and are content with little rather than being content with the things of God. We sell ourselves short of what He has to offer. He has so much more to offer us, and yet we take little tidbits of it. I just want bacon bits. I don't want the peace. You know? Do you want all that God has to offer? Only you can make the change this morning. Verse 23 tells us that this guy, he was very sad because he had to get rid of his stuff and make changes. He was very sad. He walked away sad because he was very rich. He says extremely rich. Have you ever been sad because you had to get rid of something? Have you ever been sad like that? What was the last time you were sad because of your sin? Because that's what he tells us to do. When was the last time you grieved over that? You know that, that that's checking your pulse right there. That's better than the old Fitbit. Is the things of God. That's checking where we're at this morning. It's about sacrifice, not success. It's about repentance and submission to the Holy One. It's not about us. If you haven't realized that, it's about him. Jesus seen this guy become very sad, said how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Again, we're seeing here that it's hard to enter because our heart is divided if you remember looking back at, at the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, when they were leaving the city, Lot's wife, looking back into the world. She was always looking back and she was still connected. And she didn't make it out. She wanted to look back. Her heart was divided or sold out there. In James 4.4, out of the Living Bible, says this. You are like an unfaithful wife who loves her husband's enemies. Do you not realize that making friends with God's enemies, the evil pleasures of this world, make you an enemy of God? I say it again, that if your aim is to enjoy the evil pleasures of the unsaved world, you cannot also be a friend of God. It's hard enough for us that don't have a lot of money to enter the kingdom of God, but how much more the filthy rich? You know, he calls us to enter in through the narrow gate. Hard to, 
hard and few who find it, he says. But the rich, I can see the scene, him standing at the gate. You know, I can do a transaction. I can do a wire transfer right now. How do I get it in? How much is it? Or you, can I borrow a pen? I can write you a check. I don't think that's going to happen there for these people. Because their heart is where they think they're going to buy everything. That can't even buy your health. There's some debate about verse 25, about the eye of a needle, making commentators trying to bring out something that of great value to this, but it is what it says. It's the eye of a threading needle. That's all it is. It's almost an impossibility to get a camel. Well, it is an impossibility to get a camel through an eye of a needle. So that's what he's talking about. Why would anyone with a camel want to shove a huge animal like that through a small tiny gate where it had to kneel to pass through when there was a large city gate around the corner? It just doesn't make sense. Also, there was no evidence to support this claim that there was even such a gate that was found, as they call it, the needle gate. I wanted to boil this down a little bit further so it was easier to understand of the needle gate and how to pass through and all this stuff and the tightness of it. And I could have explained it this way. Have you ever laid on the bed to button your pants? I, no, I'm, I'm not going to go there. No, I, please forgive me. I'm not going to go there. So we won't go. How, no, please forget that thought. Verse 26 and verse 27. I had to get a smirk on your face somewhere. Those who heard it said, then who can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. People in that culture believed that if you were rich, you're blessed by God. That's why they, why they got this statement. Then if they can't get in, how are we even going to make this transition of being saved? How, how, how is that all going to happen? No human being has the power to, in himself to save himself, to make this exchange. No human has the power to to forsake himself or his pride or his selfish desires. No one has that power. But God does. Only God can change your heart. God can change your heart this morning and put you onto a different path this morning. This is the sovereign work of the Lord Jesus Christ. No matter how you feel, uh, we can't make that exchange. We can't say, oh, I'm saved today. I'm saved. We could, but it's the Holy Spirit coming upon us that makes that change for us. Because if not, we'll go right back into where we were. You know, anything is possible with God. You know why I know this? is because I know where some of you were and I know where, once, where I once was. And you guys know where some of you have been and how he redeemed you. We were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. He was slain for me and for you. His blood spoke righteousness for us. That we would have a relationship with, this, with us. Are you thinking this morning you're facing something impossible? Scripture tells us that everything is possible with God. There's hope in Jesus Christ. That same person that split the Red Sea is your same God. There's nothing impossible. It's how much you want to be sold out for him. How much, how much do you want it? How much do you want Jesus? Or how much do you want of this stuff that's beyond these doors? is the question. Let's uh, look at verses 28 and 30. And Peter said, See, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house, wife, or brothers, or parents, or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times more in this time in the age to come eternal life. Bless Peter's heart. Kind of reminds me of myself. Always has to say something. And we've got to say something. Let's look back for a second and look at some earlier chapters in Luke here. And try to get a better sense of what he's saying here. In Luke 
Then he, Jesus, said to the crowd, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. I think those are words of Jesus. In fact, they are. Luke 14, again, in verse 26, it says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father, mother, and wife, and children, and brothers, and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. As we talked about before, man, that's pretty harsh. What he's saying is that you got to love him above everything else. That's exactly what he's saying. That's what we are called to do. In uh, Luke 14, 33, he also finishes up in that passage saying, So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. So this gives us a better idea of what's being said. And here it said that once again, if you're stuck in the middle, you can't be with me. Stuck in the middle of what? You might be asking this morning. Half in the world and half into Jesus. That heart divided. Of one, Which one robs you more of what? Matthew 12, 30 tells us, Anyone who isn't with me opposes me, and anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. Lastly, whatever you have given up will be well worth it. Does Jesus want you to live on the side of the road in a cardboard box? No. He just wants all of you. He wants your heart. He wants you to be thinking more about him then about that big screen TV, about the next playoff, the next, that's what he wants. He wants more of you. Does he care about you have a nice house, a nice car? No. He's blessed us. But how much is your heart in that? Is that all you think about? He said that you will receive many times more here. That very breath that you're breathing right now, there's one of them. How many times do you count the blessings of our God that he gives you on a daily basis? And then he said that we'll receive much more there. Is, it, is he talking money? Silly, the streets are made of gold. <laughs> I told first service, we're probably going to make paper airplanes with money if there's even money there. So that's something to play with. So what do you get when you give up all these passing earthly riches? You get spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus at this time. You'll get all the treasure of heaven in eternity. That's good enough for me. That's what I want. I think once we're at heaven's gates, once we pass into heaven's gates, we will, would have wished, we would have sacrificed more, prayed more, loved more, sweated more, grieved more, and wept more for the things of God. Once we pass into eternity and say, I should have done more for him, rather than the little piece I settled for. I'm tired of living that way. I need more of him in me. Are you willing to get rid of anything and everything that you love more than Jesus in order to follow Jesus? What's holding you back? Are you willing to give up your wealth, your influence, your position, your authority, relationships, drugs, career, fame, and so on? Is there anything that stands between you and Jesus that you're unwilling to give up? You'll never know the true joy and peace in your life until you surrender everything and follow Jesus. Complete surrender, submission to our Lord Jesus Christ. He paid a high price for each one of us. How will you respond? If I could boil this message down this morning, it would be this. Eternal life is for those who love the Lord their God with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind, and all their strength. Far more than self, far more than worldly possessions. This world has bogged us down, if you haven't realized. 
and it slows us down from following the things of God. God, it, it like puts those scales on our eyes to see the things and the blessings of God. He still works miracles today if we're looking for them, if we're praying for them. Oh, I prayed last night. I prayed, I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord. Look at Matthew 7, 21 again. Not all who come to me saying, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Finish reading the rest of that out. You could walk away this morning sad like this guy. Or you can make a choice this morning to commit your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And repent of where you've been. You can make that choice this morning to turn your life let him turn your life around. Let him turn your, yourself upside down and shake the marbles out of your heart. That's what we need this morning. We need him. Let him allow you to do the work this morning in your heart. Let him change you from the inside out, not from this facade that we can put on that everybody sees. Let him get a hold of your heart this morning and let him change you into that new creation that we hear. Many of you here this morning have read the agreement of terms and conditions in God's word. And although voluntarily, will you follow them? Or will you just coast on and living the way you're living? He gave me a wake up call and told me, Leonard, you need to make changes. I'm sharing that with you this morning from the heart that we all need to make changes. We need to wake up. We need to wake up to the things of God. Why don't you stand with me? Thanks for listening in. If you have any questions about New Life Living, you can call us at area code 505-898-9788 or email us at info at nlnm.org. Until next time, our prayer and hope is you will experience the fullness of the new life Jesus has to offer you.